God, this fries my brain. Right. My name's Matt Estley and I'm a professionally trained furniture maker here in the UK. And by my best estimations, it seems the world is going quite frankly mental. And so in response to it all, I've decided to pack it all in and live off grid in a van. So far in this series, we've gone out, purchased a van, cleaned it all up and added skylights, windows and solar panels. And so in this one, we're gonna begin the tedious job of insulating the floor, walls and ceiling. Let's get going. I decided to attack this stage from the ground up. So we're gonna begin by creating a grid work using these roofing battens for the floor insulation. These things are about 4.8 meters long and they were absolutely soaking when they turned up this morning. So I'm just letting them dry out in the sun and then we'll get fitting them. So while those are drying, what I'm gonna do in here is mark the rough locations of the furniture, the stud walls, and anywhere where I would like to have a fixing point of some kind. These battens will eventually be covered in plywood, which in itself is a very strong material and can easily hold a fixing. But strategically placing these battens in high load areas will just help strengthen the overall construction and is worth the investment. So right around the step here, you get this minging bit of trim and all it's doing is hiding this electrical connection thing. What I'm thinking about doing with a batten around here is actually having it overhang the step like this, obviously cut a little notch out the back for the wire. But then what I'll be able to do is get the floor on that and then create a 90 degree face down here, which will also be plywood of some kind, scribe it to fit this and then that will hide this electrical connection in a nice 90 degree corner rather than using this cheap looking trim here. As each baton was cut to size, it was compressed and sometimes shimmed into position, then glued down with an adhesive. Once they were fixed, I came back with an electric planer and flattened off all the high spots. But as I was approaching the back, I began thinking about how I wanted to finish the floor off. Now I've been told countless times throughout this project that I should not be trying to reinvent the wheel, but I kind of want to for this section. I think I could try and make it look a little bit more uh, natural. My plan was to use an off cut from the river table to be all sentimental and shit and to use it to create a hard wearing, durable, pillowed edge at the back of the van that will protect the vinyl floor from damage. And so we'll be fitting that in the next episode, but they're all in place, they're all even, they feel pretty secure. So it's time to start insulating them. Now I've got three sheets of this 25 millimeter PIR, which I'm gonna to use to insulate the floor. And to cut it, I've stolen this bread knife from home. And so now, one by one, the boards were cut to size to fit the areas between the battens. I slowly began to realise that the bread knife wasn't actually that good for cutting insulation because the thickness of the blade caused it to bind. So I eventually switched to using my marking knife. Okay, so it's certainly a lot more blinding in here now, especially when the sun is coming from that direction, but it's looking pretty good. The only thing I want to do before starting to tape up the joints and tape up the edges is fill in some of these gaps around the edges. Oh, that's loud. So the next logical step is to start putting the plywood floor down. However, I can't get the floor in position until I remove these two gray bits of trim. And if I'm gonna take off them, I might as well get rid of the bulkhead liner as well. The reason for this is firstly to insulate it, which is pretty self-explanatory. But secondly, I've seen a lot of people turn this into a really handy storage area for miscellaneous items that if you were living in a home, would normally just go up in the attic. I've been putting it in backwards. <laughs> How? Why? Oh, what an idiot. What's an idiot? This shelf will be supported by three brackets that share the fixing holes for the sun visor and the trim. And I'll be using a nice thick board of either 15 or 18 millimeter plywood so it spans the distance without any bending and stuff. Right, I need that because now the trim was out of the way, I could begin creating templates for my new floor. But 
There's a couple of reasons why I'm not creating an exact replica of the old floor when creating the new one. What am I doing here? The first one is that the join in the old floor just simply doesn't line up with the framework below. And the second one is that the old floor is actually a bit too small to fit in the van. There's a lot of wiggle room I could take up here by sizing the sheets accurately. And what I'm going to do to make the floor fit perfectly is use some of the excess cardboard I've got from all the deliveries from this bloody project and actually stick the cardboard down to this surface but overhanging so it hits the wall. I can then lift up the entire floor with the cardboard attached, stick that down to my new piece of plywood and then trace around the entire thing. In my head, that works but we'll see. I cut all of the joining edges using the track saw to get a nice straight 90 degree edge. But as for the ones that were going against the edge of the van, I used the jigsaw to cut these with a 30 degree undercut on it. This would just make it slightly easier to scribe the shape of the van and prevent the floor from binding on any weird rounded areas underneath. The technique wasn't perfect and required a bit of trimming here and there, but with a bit of patience, I got a brilliant result at the end. As you can see, the boards land perfectly on the batten below, but there's a little bit of misalignment with the edge of the boards, and so I marked this with a knife and then took it off with a track saw. This process was more or less repeated for the rest of the floor panels, but I'll cover the ins and outs of that on the detailed series on the second channel. The only one I screwed up slightly was the last panel where I mismeasured it and was left with this little gap that I had to fill with the shim afterwards. But it'll be covered with a vinyl floor later, so you know, just, just don't tell anyone. To help prevent any misalignment and unevenness over time, I located the boards together using dominoes. You could also use a biscuit jointer for this, but it's not completely necessary. I also went ahead and added some solid wood lipping to the back corners of the floor, which I carefully scribed into position. Again, this would help prevent chipping and add durability to the back corners. Once everything was in position, I marked out the location of the battens using a chalk line and got it fixed down with screws, and then cut off any excess around the step area with the jigsaw and multi-tool, and then flush trimmed it with the router. It's a lovely rainy day here in the UK, so what better time to start doing the 12 volt and a, and a little bit of 230 volt electrics. So here we've got a schematic which is bespoke. I haven't taken this from anywhere. I have drawn this from scratch. You will not find a video anywhere in this playlist describing how I designed this because I am not an electrician and honestly, I haven't really got an idea of what I'm doing. What I mean by that is I've got no experience in this whatsoever and I've learned everything I know up to now just from books and watching videos online. But the reason we're needing to do the electrics now is to roughly root all of the wires into place before they get hidden behind the walls. And so I began by figuring out whereabouts I could thread the wiring throughout the van and also focused on tidying up the existing wiring as well. I've been told countless times that electrics is easy once you get started, but honestly, I'm not feeling confident in this whatsoever. The majority of the circuitry in this van only requires 1.5 millimeter core cable, but after doing some calculations, I'm actually bumping a lot of it up to 2.5. It also gives me a bit more safety on the wires. The only drawback being the extra thickness makes them a bit harder to get into position. All right, so I very quickly ran out of conduit. I'm just waiting on delivery for some more. As I come into the van, I want to be able to have a switch somewhere here to be able to turn the lights on so what i'm doing is i'm going to put a switch right here above the bulkhead and this is going to power four leds around this sort of main communal area but then on the flip side when i'm coming out of bed into a dark room i don't want to have to traverse all the way to the other end of the van to turn on that set of lights so what i'm going to do is have a separate row of lights along here that will illuminate the sort of hallway and kitchen area with a switch just to the left of me now not only do i want to wire in a switch here for the leds but i also want a separate switch that's going to power the toilet fan and the shower light as well. This might sound like a lot, but it was all stuff that I put a ton of thought in way before doing this wiring. And so if you want to find out more about how I designed the van, check out the video appearing in the top corner now. And I've also put a link in the description. All right, so next we're going to do the oven, fridge and heater. Now these are actually going to be on their own fuse board. So on the main fuse board, I'm going to have a sort of kitchen appliances one. That's going to feed a secondary fuse board via a four millimeter cable. And then on there, I'll have the oven, fridge and uh, boiler on separate trips. I'm doing this because I have so many circuits running through this van that I actually ran out of space on my fuse board. But the added benefit of having all the kitchen appliances on their own fuse board is that I can wire it in a place that's accessible from the main compartment of the van rather than needing to go into the garage area to isolate them. Jesus Christ! Bloody hell! Ah. Ah, you get, come on! 
Once all the wires were roughly rooted, I brought them all through to the garage area and cut them to length with plenty of excess to feed into the main fuse board. All right, so now we're gonna do a quick continuity test, which serves two functions. Firstly, it confirms that the wire is sound and it's capable of carrying a current to and from the source. And secondly, it also checks that I've labeled everything correctly. This is done by twisting the positive and negative cables together at one end, then attaching probes from the multimeter to the other end, which sends a very small current through it and lets out a beeping sound if it's complete. Lovely. So we have continuity to that one. That's satisfying. So I went and checked each wire individually and was able to confirm that all of the circuits were okay. So then I moved on to the final there wire. We are looking for the battery, which given this symbol here, probably means there's a battery in here. But we also need to figure out a way of connecting a cable to it that runs to the back corner of the van. All right. Many warning signs. <laughs> this is to wire in what's called a DC to DC converter, which in layman's terms is a device that allows me to recharge the leisure batteries off the vehicle battery itself. So this is 16 millimeter core cable, which is what uh, was recommended. Basically, it's a secondary backup source of power in addition to the solar panels I've already installed. I wasn't gonna actually connect it to the battery yet because clearly I don't want it to be live while still working on it. All I wanted to do at this point was get it cut to length and routed through the body of the van so I could begin working on the next stage, which is the insulation. And we're gonna be attacking insulation in three different ways. First one is gonna be noise cancellation. Second one is gonna be sort of thermal heat entrapment. And the third one is going to be in the form of a vapor barrier that will prevent condensation. We began by adding sound deadening mats to all of the panels on the van. These are made of a very high density foam with an extremely sticky face on them. And the intention is that they add mass to panels that would otherwise vibrate while the van is in motion. This would otherwise add a ton of noise, which is completely avoidable with the addition of these mats. Definitely better. Now the sound produced by vibrations was minimized, I next wanted to focus on preventing sound from entering and exiting the van, and so I purchased some of this Dodo Superliner, which is both a thermo and acoustic insulation. Of course, most of these areas will eventually be filled with rigid insulation, and so we weren't necessarily using this mat for its thermal properties, with exception to the area above the driver's cab, which by no means necessary would have been able to be insulated with rigid board. The same goes for the area above the wheel arch. There's just too many curves going on to deal with. Next, we began to stuff all the cavities with rock wool, making sure to leave it nice and fluffy so it retains its thermal properties. Rock wool seems to be used a lot in van conversions, but it gets an equal amount of flack as well, mainly for its ability to take on moisture. A workaround for this that I since learned after insulating the van would be to put the rock wool in plastic bags, which will allow it to retain all of its thermal properties, but also add an element of water resistance as well. Next was the rigid insulation board. Cutting this and carving this to shape was the most tedious, boring thing I've ever ever done, but out of all of the commercially available forms of insulation you can get, this stuff is by far the best. And so by using a combination of a bread knife, a Japanese saw and a multi-tool, this was shaped and carved to fit all of the inside cavities and fit flush with the internal ribs of the van. All right, so before fitting the rigid board into these sections, I want to get some sort of wooden rib in here that I can use to screw the cladding up into. Of course, I could do this into the metal structure, but that would mean I would have to use self-tapping screws in order to fix whatever cladding I'm using rather than screw up into wood that can not only accept a variety of screws but can also accept pins as well. I did this by dividing the roof into thirds and cutting three battens each to fit. Then each one of these battens was scribed individually to match the profile of each rib. The problem with these ribs is that they have a slight angle on them which needs to be cancelled out and so to account for this I tilted the bed on the bandsaw and ripped the angle onto the edge of the battens. The reason I'm screwing these onto the side of the ribs rather than the bottom, which is the more conventional method, is because I'm six foot one and I need to maximize as much headroom as possible. What I'm using for this is this really handy countersinking screwdriver bit from Bosch that just grips in your drill and then on the end you can have a Phillips, but then if you push this up, flip it round, push it back in, you've then got a drill bit and a countersink on the other end. I'll pop a link to this in the description below because it's been really useful to me over the years and this is just another great use case example. Ah, right. Didn't think about that. 
With a bit of forethought, things like this generally aren't needed, but in sticky situations like that, they can be very useful. This one is actually a proper attachment for the drill, but you can get like auxiliary ones for this because they can be very, very useful. Of course, the cladding is going to need something at the ends to fix into. And so using a spirit level, I added an extra batten to the end of the van that was perfectly in line with the rest of them and also messed around a bit with the wiring to make sure it was out of the way. I also took time to prop up and support some of the roof panels that had been distorted from my fat ass walking all over the van while installing the solar panels and skylights. So with all that done, I could get back to the roof insulation, which was significantly easier than carving all of those wall panels. The other advantage here is that I was able to use my tape measure's built-in marking gauge to establish a straight parallel line, simply lock it at the desired distance and drag it down the insulation. So after four to five days of pure hell, all I had to do was go back with some expanding foam both to fill the gaps and to lock the rigid boards in place, cut off any excess, and then move on to the final layer of insulation. And so next we need to add this, which is a double-sided foil barrier, and it's what's referred to as a vapor barrier. In a nutshell, this is an imper yeah, impermeable, impermeable barrier that prevents warm, moist air from inside the van reaching the cold metal shell of the van, thus creating condensation. If you wanna learn more about this and honestly insulation in general, Greg Virgo's got some amazing videos on the subject that I've put links to below. I'd highly recommend checking it out because it cleared up so many questions for me. The majority of this vapor barrier was fixed down with spray adhesive, but then I did use a couple of staples in certain areas to help hold it in position. And then I came back with foil tape and covered all of the joints, all of the staples to make it as impermeable as possible. There is a point of diminishing returns with this. And so you can't expect yourself to get every single area, trust me. I tried. Just get as much covered as you can. I've been told that van conversions are more about mitigation when it comes to condensation rather than full prevention. But that's the van all fully insulated and so in the next video we're going to begin getting the vinyl floor down and possibly even begin some stud work. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you then.